because there's a lot of definitions of holy. But keeper of his word is, is one of them. And, uh, and I'm thinking about that tonight because a long time ago when my kids were little and we were in a denominational church, the Lord told us to stay there. We were, and I wanted to leave, and the Lord said, stay there. And I was like, Lord, I have two boys. You got to take care of them, and you got to show them who you really are in the midst of all this. And as keeper of his word, God did. And now I have well, all of our kids are wonderful, but the two youngest ones are men of God, and they love the Lord, and we're very blessed to have them serving with us in the ministry. And uh, I'm very, very blessed. And so, um, so Stephen and Johnny are very special to us. But tonight I've asked Johnny to come. You, know, you got to understand, growing up, Johnny was the one who would never go on stage. And he would never be in front of people. But, but he's the one now that the Lord is calling at this time. And, and I just feel like he has a message. He has a thing that the Lord has given him, insight the Lord's given to him that we need now in this season before we go into the next um, change of the ages. So, Johnny, why don't you come and do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And it's not dangerous because the Holy Spirit's telling you to do it. You read my mind. <laughs> I was just about to say that's dangerous. Oh, well, good night, everybody. <laughs> this ought to be fun. Because, well, I taught Sunday morning for the pre-teaching. I can't tell if that's loud. Is that loud for everybody else or just me? I'm not used to hearing myself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. So I taught Sunday morning, and before that, I haven't been able to touch anything. I can't study. I can't do any of that stuff for any of this. But ever since then, for the last day and a half, my spirit has been sitting with Eber and Abraham and discussing some of these things that are coming about. So it's, it's very interesting because my spirit's been going, but my mind hasn't. So I know I've been there, but I haven't heard what I thought I heard, and I don't know what I actually know. So here we go. <laughs> so mom had asked me to discuss some of the, uh, the ages that she had taught about last week. So let's, let's start there. So last week we talked about the four divisions of the ages. And that's not all of them. Can everyone see? Better? Okay. I don't need that. <laughs> oh, okay. So here we have where it all started, the beginning. Here we have, this section is the patriarchs with the flood in the middle. Here we have um, the patriarchs, the law, the law, and then, was it the kings? Judges and the kings, okay. I was trying to use your notes for that part because I have completely different notes on that. So uh, patriarchs will be the P, L for law. Then you have enlightenment or um, knowledge, church. Um, that's not going to spell anything. Um, and then we're going into this section right here, which is um, what we've called the kingdom age, but a better definition of it is the age of Zion. Because um, technically, within the church age, we have been in the kingdom age. That's where it's been formed. Because the kingdom age is the fivefold bringing us into maturity. 
So you have all the teachers bringing us into kingship. So that's where we're moving into now, is taking a hold of that kingship and moving forward. Everyone good so far? So... So right about here is where we're at. And don't worry about the diagram. It's just visual. So really, we're at the end of... We're at the end of a one big section, which is, if you want to get technical, the seven, seven days of creation. You have your first section, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, moving into the seventh, which is the rest, the completion, the perfection of all that has come before it. So next, we're moving into seven. After that, we go into eight, and it swings back the other way. It's a pendulum. And if you need a clarification, just raise your hand and I'll switch back. But what it is, is it's a, it's, does that make sense to anybody? Okay, good, because it's going away. Huh? <laughs> Don't worry about it. it that's all recap. Okay. I feel sorry for the guys online that didn't watch last week and have no idea where I'm at right now. But if you're on YouTube or on Facebook... It's the one before, it's the video before this. So if you're lost, feel free to go back. Debbie Trail definitely did an amazing job at explaining all this. And I am rambling because I'm trying to figure out where I'm supposed to start. But it's good that everyone is laughing because it opens them up to the weirder things that I'm going to get into. Because, hey, this is a distraction. Hey, Stephen, can you turn me down just a hair? I can hear myself humming. It probably doesn't help to understand any other speaker. I got yellow. Okay. So, we've seen that we're up to the seven so far. So, imagine... The menorah, you have first age, second age, third age, fourth age, fifth age, sixth age, and now we're lighting the seventh age. So, luckily we're in Hanukkah. You know what it means when all the candles are lit. It means that the festival is coming to a close, but it's the greatest days of that festival because all the gifts have been opened. You get to play with everything. All the food is on the table. You get to eat everything. Everything tastes good. All the people are happy. That's where we're at. <laughs> Cheers from the crowd. <laughs> so, but that also means that this isn't everything. Because... As we've learned from the menorah, I'll, I'll move just a second, that it is only a mirror of what's above. Because every, not in front of the speaker, every rainbow is a full circle, but it hits the earth before it makes a circle. So what is reflected above is reflected below. This is very mystical talk, so the more you think about it, the more it'll come out. 
If you're taking notes, you're going to have to draw these diagrams really, really fast. Because <laughs> I don't have a big enough board for all the things that I'm doing. But then, the next thing is, it's a fractal of where we started. Because you have these mirrored. And then each of these is again mirrored. And then each of these is mirrored. And it goes on and on and on forever. That's why whenever you see something that's dimensional, it, it never stops unfolding. This is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to unfold it, to release it, to bring it out. So everything that you see now is only a speck of what has come out of the mouth of God and out of the mind of God. Everything that you begin to unfold, there's that many more layers. So does that make sense to everyone so far? I feel like I'm rambling, but I know I'm going somewhere. <laughs> OK. So, like I said at the beginning, this, this age that we're moving into is the age of Zion. And how we know we're moving into the age is, again, looking at the stars, there's everyone, everyone's kind of seen the Jupiter and Saturn coming together. Okay, there's more happening during that night, and what's, a lot of what's happening is, um, this isn't astrology, it's just the terminology. But all of the planets, which symbolize all the gods or all the rulers, are coming into one house, which is the constellation of Capricorn, which also is, the picture is a sea goat, but it's the things that were liquid are becoming solid. The things that are changing from the fish into the goat, from sea onto land. It's becoming established, becoming a foundation. Um, the other thing that's happening is we're moving from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius, which Pisces is the two fish. Aquarius is the water bearer, whose water never stops flowing. Um, the next big thing, I'll put it all together at the end, but the next big thing is Jupiter and Saturn are exchanging their power. The last, um, the last age was ruled by Jupiter. The next age is ruled by Saturn. Jupiter is known as the king or the ruler or he's the ruler of the heavens. Saturn is time, creation, waters. It's everything that we've been working towards um, for the mystically minded, you know what the waters mean, you know all that. So the symbolism basically says that we're moving into the time that's been established for the outpouring. So for the layman that knows the Bible, the prophecy of Joel where it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and that God will be seen in the earth, that Zion will come and all will go up to the mountain of the Lord. All of those prophecies are talking about this time. When man becomes what he's supposed to be, comes back into the fullness of who he is, and then walks with God. And then all that, again, the, the Bible says that there are vessels of gold and silver and there are vessels of earth and clay. It's time to switch from being an, a vessel of earth and clay that can be easily broken, that can be cracked, that can be spoiled, that is no, of no worth except to be destroyed if it is soiled, to being refined in the fire, to dealing with all the junk, to going into the next thing and being refined into gold and silver. Because the Bible also says that in the last days, the fire will come 
and their works will be tested. That which is of gold and silver will stand. That which is of hay and stubble will be burned away. That's what we're moving into because just, just like Revelation has two parts. You have the good part and the bad part. The millennium, millennial reign and the fire that destroys is not a bad prophecy. <laughs> it's not an end of the world prophecy. It's a prophecy that's saying this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. When the perfect, when the perfect has come, the old things pass away. And it's just like um, whenever the best analogy I can come up with is you have a janitor that's worked years and years and years and has always had his eye on the position of a manager. But he's faithful in the janitorial ring or ring. But then his boss comes in and upgrades him to being a manager. Is he any longer a janitor? Does he clean the toilets at all? That's what we're moving into. Because we, we've, those who have proven themselves faithful are being moved from what they've known as authority to true authority. What they've known as ownership, of taking care of things, of making sure things got taken care of, moving into managing and making sure that others take care of it. That others, does that make sense? We're moving out of learning to be kings and priests and stepping into being the kings and priests. And there's not just kings and priests. Because just like there's the fivefold ministry, you have the prophets, you have the pastors, you have the teachers, you have the kings, you have the priests, but you also have legislatures, you also have oracles. So like we have the prophets now that go, they hear, and they speak. The oracle takes it one step further. They go, sit before God, speak with him, and then they come back and show, and show the world what they've seen. They don't, it's no longer just about what you hear because language isn't worth all that much. It's just an idea that they're portraying. But when you've seen it, you can do more with it. You can describe it. You can tell how it tastes. You can, when you've been there, you can do that. And that's, that's what we're moving, that's what we're moving towards. Um, I got to get off that soapbox. Okay. <laughs> the, there's more in heaven and earth than angels and demons. There's more in the world than heaven and earth. There's more in the underworld than just hell. There's more underworlds than just hell. Whenever you try and narrow down a theology, it, it winds up muddying what we already had. And it winds up making everything harder to understand. Because you ask someone if they believe in Bigfoot or the UFOs, they're going to say yes or no because they know what they believe. You ask someone if they believe in angels and demons, it depends on which denomination they're in. That's, it doesn't make any sense. You ask someone if they believe in spirits, it depends on what they've seen, what they've experienced. But we all know that we're spirits. So how can you not believe in what you are? That these are the things that we're going to have to start narrowing out and clearing up because there's so much sagebrush beneath the trees that you can't see the trunks. There's so much brush that you can't see the roots. And if you can't see the roots, how will you see where the tree is? If you can't see the roots, where will you know where the nutrients are coming from? That's, you can judge a tree by the fruits, but good fruit can still come when there's not much nutrients in the soil. You, you have to have balance. 
you have to have both. There's more in this world than black and white. But if you start leaning in the gray too much, then you're going to fall to one or the other. So there's a balance. Because if you're so quick to say something is bad, then you're going to call what God is saying good, evil. If you're so quick to say that everything is good, then you're not going to recognize evil when it shows up. There has to be a balance. And that's, that's important in this age. Because everything that you think is superheroes and supernatural is going to be very evident in these next the next few years, let alone the next 2,000. Because whenever we're talking about ages, at least in this realm, we're talking about like 2,100 year of rain, or not rain, I keep saying rain. There's a, there's a reason there, someone else is gonna get it. <laughs> but it, we're talking about 2,100 roughly years of time span. So by that range, you're looking at a Six or well, four thousand to six thousand year old Earth, whereas you can go however much you want, depending on your terminologies. But I don't really want to talk about what we're moving, what this means. I want to talk about what we're moving into, because I can tell you all day long that the door is in the wall. But until you step through that door and see what's on the other side, you're never going to believe it's a door. You're going to think it's like that picture over there, which everyone says is a picture, but they walk into it anyways. So <laughs> the, the people who have been here will get that, and most of them still have glitter on their face. <laughs> That's terrible. Bad Johnny. Okay. <laughs> Anywho, but does it make sense what I'm saying? There, there's, more, there's more to this than what we've seen. What we've seen is only a crack in the mirror. And every, anytime you push on that crack, there's more cracks that are going to form. There's more layers to unravel. There's more, there's more, just more. Because anytime that you see something, that's no longer it. The Bible says that I has not seen nor ear heard what the Lord has planned for those who love him. So if you've seen something and you love the Lord, there's always one more step. Usually there's a marathon after that, but there's always one more step. So you may feel like you're stuck and stuck in a room and all the doors are locked, but small keys open big doors. Anything that you find that unlocks one thing unlocks multiple things. Every door leads to multiple rooms until you get outside and then you got all of the rooms in one room, but that's here nor there. So don't get bogged down with where you are, but also don't get stuck, don't get stuck in the birth canal. Because one door leads to another door leads to another door. If you, get, if you get so stuck holding on to where you are, you'll never move to the next door. It, if you get stuck, um, you're a preacher. You've been a preacher for 20 years. And something new comes along, and the maturity comes to the church. And the church is being done away with because the training has come and the maturity has come and you're stuck being a pastor, then you'll never grow past into the next thing that you're supposed to be. If you're a prophet, and all you know is, I can hear the Lord and I can speak it and things happen, then what happens when the next level of maturity comes and everyone's an oracle and they're going and seeing what God is doing, they're coming back and telling you what they're seeing, and they're doing things and they're, they're interacting with things that you never thought were possible, but all you know is you can hear God and you can say what God is saying and things happen, then you can't move forward. So you have to be willing to let go of what you are to become what you're supposed to be. You have to be willing to let go of the shell to grow into the full plant. 
You have to be willing to let go of the fruit, even though it's a tasty apple. Eventually, that seed has to go into the ground. Eventually, it has to become something more so that more apples can come. Eventually, the old has to die so that the new can come. The Bible says that um, to those that are in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and new has come. So why, when you get into Christ, do you still have that old? The old mindset, the old nature, the old everything that you're struggling with. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The only reason you're struggling is because of the patterns of the past. The only reason that you're struggling with it is because you haven't realized that you can let go and break, go, break that pattern and step into the new. You can become that new. Um, There's something there. You can become that new. can't move forward. I don't know what that is. To him, this is just purely mystical, so whatever you get, you get. But to him who stands and walks between the candlesticks, to him who has the seven stars in his hand, let them have glory and be praised. For they have come into the fullness for they have come into the fullness. I get the feeling you're going to see this symbol a lot tonight. But everyone knows what I'm talking about when I'm saying the seven candlesticks, right? The menorah and the, we have one over here. There, there's a lot of secrets hidden with that candle, with that candlestick. For Hanukkah, we know it's the symbol of what they did for the temple and all that. That's not really what it's about. 
Yes. Either one. I don't know. We're going with seven because seven is the number that we're working with. Um, I don't know where this is going, so if it's too far off, you guys stop me. <laughs> but you have you have the mirrors that go up and down. You also have the mirrors that go to and fro. You also have different points on the axis. You also have different worlds to interact with. You also have the wheels within wheels. All of these are mirrored in micro and ma macro versions of the Earth. You see it in the atom, how they circle around the nucleus. You see it in the planets, how they circle around their solar systems. You see it in the universe, how they circle around other universe. You see it in galaxies, how they spin. Everything cycles. Everything circles. Everything comes around. You also have momentum that swings like a pendulum. When it comes to the ages, there are cycles, which are seasons. There are times. There are appointed times. There are also pendulum swings, where one thing goes to an extreme, they come back. They always find center, but they always continue to swing. Everything has momentum. Everything moves. We've seen it in the past um, patterns. Whenever they got, um, whenever they got the law, they swung all the way until they were following nothing but the law, and there was no grace. And then they swung back, and then there was grace and nothing but the grace. And they lost the law. Now they're swinging back, and the law and the grace are coming together. But now it's something different. So there's, but now it's mysticism because they're working with the laws in grace. So now there's leeway to move, and they understand it. So they, you see the momentum. They pick something up, and they keep moving forward. And then they swing back, they catch what they missed, and they swing back forward. There's momentum, and then there's cycles. Right now, we're at the end, we're almost, we're in the last two eras of, you remember the earlier of the timeline? We were in the last two little dashes. We're at the end of that momentum swing. The first eight are completed, or almost completed. Then it'll be time to come back, back into eternity, back into everything. There's both swings. Again, this is mystical, so there's more. But there's more. Everything that I'm saying tonight, there's always more. I have no idea where I'm going. <laughs> I'm swinging back and forth, and I'm going in circles. But there's a reason for all of this. There's a reason that before the devil could come and present himself as a son of God, he had to go to and fro and up and down. There's a reason that it was in that order. There's a reason. And just because the devil did it doesn't mean there's not a principle there. The only reason he was doing it was because we weren't doing it. That's why Job was being questioned, because where were you when this happened? Where did you command the dawn? to see the sun rise? Did you command the morning? Were you there whenever 
Do you know where darkness sleeps and the ways of light? You were born then. That's what the Bible says. Do you know the gates of death? We're working right now on moving into immortality. If you don't know where the gates of death are, then why does it matter that Jesus has the keys to hell and death? If you don't know where the gates are, what, the, what use are the keys? So there's a reason why he calls himself what he calls himself in Revelation, because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the out the outing of who he is. It's the showing of what he is. And what he is is what we're supposed to be. That's why the earth ends in Revelation, because a new earth comes, because everything is renewed. Whenever the fullness comes, the old is put away. Whenever the new stuff comes, the old is thrown away or is burned away. There's, there's a refining that has to happen. There's a coming of maturity to the fruit. There's, we can't stay where we've stood. Even We've quoted this verse a lot here, but I checked it out the other day. And it says, doing all to stand, stand therefore. And there's more to that verse, but we always stop at the stand. It's, it's right in smack dab in the middle of the army of God. It's like doing all that you can to stand, stand therefore, and resist. And it goes on into actual, actual action. It's not just stand. Because if you're standing still, you're an easy target. Even if you have the best armor in the world, you take enough shots in the same place, you're going to get shot. You have to keep moving. You have to move forward. You have to maintain momentum because you're going forward or you're going back, and the pendulum always swings. So you have to know where you're going. You have to know. Of course, I say that. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> but... <laughs> At this point, I'm saying stuff to make you laugh because it's what I'm saying is serious, but it's there's so much to it that if you don't laugh now, it'll bog you down. And I'm, I'm not trying to be this guy. It's just you have there has to be a smile on your face, or the joy of the Lord isn't in it, and then God's not in it because God follows where His joy is. So you have to laugh with this stuff, or it's just. I heard it put this way this week. It's like you have a, you're a kid and you got a new toy on Christmas and you're playing with it and you're just loving it and your dad sits down beside you and he's playing with you and he, he's enjoying playing with you not because he likes the toy but because he likes playing with you. There's so much stuff that we're going to unlock in the next few years just because we're coming into that maturity of who we are, that if we don't take the time to enjoy being with our Father, then he's going to just go along with what you're doing because at least he gets to spend time with you. At least he gets to have that engagement. So it do, and this time, it really doesn't matter what we're doing. He's going to find something to enjoy with it. But... He would much rather do it with you than just do it with you. Does that make sense? So you, we need to take time. I, I've said a lot of different things and a lot of different mysteries, and those who catch it, catch it. And again, I, I've been downloaded, so I know that somebody's getting something. But... It doesn't matter if you have all the mysteries, just like Paul said. If you know all mysteries and you speak every tongue and you can do anything you want, but you don't have love, it's useless. It's absolutely useless because then you're just creating your own world and you're just doing your own thing. And it's affecting everyone, but you don't care about anyone. So what's the point? But if you, if you love and you, everything you do is an outraying of that love, then you're truly embodying what God is because God is love. It's, 
that's the simplest thing I can say, but it's the deepest thing I can ever say. If you can be love, you can be anything. I mean, you think of any superpower, anything in all the comics, I can almost guarantee, guarantee you that some man somewhere has said that he has done that when he was in love. You think about super flight. Dude, I'm in love. I feel light on my feet. I feel like I could fly through the stars. I mean, I can see everything so clearly now. X-ray vision. Is, everything comes back to love. It's simple. It's so simple. I can tell you what all the, all the sevens in all the world mean, what all the numbers mean. But what good is it going to do you if all you're doing is interpreting the signs? You can look at politics and tell you exactly where everything's going to go. But if you don't have love, then all the judgment in the world is just going to be more people getting hurt. There's no point. That's where mercy comes in. Because at some point, there has to be a stop to the judgment where the just stand firm. It, it's simple. But it's the deepest thing you can ever find. I feel like my song is sung. <laughs> Take a mom's prerogative. Okay, there's two. There's I have two questions for you. Go for it. Okay, one is, you said that the the age is better called the age of Zion, Zion. but you never explained it. So can you explain? That? Okay. So we've been calling it the age of the kingdom, correct? Okay. You look through the Bible, everywhere that the king is mentioned, it's it's almost always. How do I put this? It's always there are kings and there are gods, and they don't always add up. And it's, it's like you look through the, the book of Kings, and every single king led their nation a different way. In the age of Zion, it's all one mountain. There's not a separation. It's all, there's different paths, there's different ways, but they all lead to the top. They all lead back to the one who's on top, God. They all lead back to, if you're going up to a mountain, it's always to find God. It's never to find a king. It's never to find a ruler. It's never to find judgment because who are you going to judge on the side of a mountain? But when you get to the top, you find the wisdom that you're looking for. You find that new perspective that you're looking for. And then you can come back and govern truly. You can let no man seek his brother, saying, Know the Lord. But in that day, all men shall come unto me, and they shall know me. It's, that's the best way I can say it, is... Yes, Jesus is the king of kings, but ultimately Jesus serves God, and God reigns in Zion. So if you want to, if you want to rule in a kingdom, then pick one. You want to rule in God's kingdom, you find God and you serve him, and none other will you follow. That answer the question? <laughs> okay, so what's the other one? The other one's totally different. Okay. And that is, you were you were telling me. See, we've had a lot of discussions, but you were telling me about how each age had a symbol, and it told the story. Okay. Everyone got this that needs it. I don't even know what that is, but it's there. Welcome to the inside of my mind. Hope it scares you as much as it scares me.
I'm going to mute this for a second so I can draw. Okay, so judging by, th this is not biblical, it's just pictures, but um, judging by how astrology calls the ages, astronomy is really astrology because they came up with the system. I'm not preaching astrology, I do not condone astrology, those are my disclaimers, these are the symbols they use. This is what they've said. It's off by a margin. If you want to do it, do your own <laughs> research at that point. But these are, they say that we are moving into the age of Aquarius. And pardon my stick figures. But he's got a little pot on his. His dinghy. So it's a man pouring his water pot off of his shoulder, in case that wasn't clear. So you are here. <laughs> I'm getting on, it's getting late. Okay. Serious face. I'll explain it later if it's not clear. Okay. So, you got Taurus the bull. Uh, Taurus. Aries. The ram. And then Pisces, the fish. Okay. So according to tracing it back, around the time of the patriarchs was Taurus the bull, which those who studied the Hebrew letters know Aleph is the bull. It's the first letter, it's the head of the things, it's the strength, it's the leadership, it's those who have set in place the route which things grow in. So that's where we started. Next, we came to Aries in the time of law. Aries is a ram. He is also the symbol of um, the sacrifices, is the, theory, is the symbol of the strength of the wars that came during that time and the conquest. He's also the sign of the slavery during the Egyptian slavery. Um, so he's kind of that sacrificial beast that was taken into captivity so that he could be, serve a purpose. After that, we have Pisces during the time of Jesus up till the present. Pisces is a symbol of provision, um, life, of gathering in, of... It's the main symbol of the church, basically. Because if you look at the back of most people's bumpers that are Christian, they have the little fish on the back. That's the symbol of the New Testament church and going forward. So you really have the establishment, you have the sacrifice... And you have the provision of life. And now you have the outpouring, which is the culmination of everything that Jesus preached, all of the law, all of the prophets, all the things that the patriarch looked for is all coming out at one time and flooding the earth with that. So does that answer the question or okay. Yeah. But, okay, one more little tidbit, because I was talking about the pendulum earlier. But once we get past 
the outpouring. Everything swings back before the beginning because everything ultimately goes back to God. So everything is in God. Everything comes from God. Ultimately, everything points back to God. So you have... Hello. So you have... The entire plan is unfolded. The scroll is rolled up. At the end of the ages, what happens? Yep. It's all rolled up like a scroll. And the new one comes out because that's all written in the sky. And the sky is rolled up like a scroll. (laughs) That's all I got. Welcome to my TED Talk. (laughs) Any other questions? Anybody? Going once? Going twice? Sold. All right, I'm done. (laughs) Okay, I'll explain it again. (laughs) Yeah, okay, so what was asked is to explain what's going on with the planets on the, it's around the 22nd. It's the 20th, 21st, 22nd, and it's kind of those days. Um, But what's happening is all the planets, first, they all come into a line. just going to quickly go over this because it's a little bit later than we usually get out. Um, so they all come into a line with um, Jupiter and Saturn, I believe, coming together. And it's Jupiter covers over Saturn so that the ring is behind. So it's like an overshadowing and a is really symbolizing basically like a mantle being passed or like a crown being given. It's that kind of a exchange. Um, and the, that all happens within the house of Capricorn, which is the goat I was talking about earlier with the foundations being laid and all that. Um, but after, well, during all this time, all these planets wind up within that house together. So it's almost like, if you want a mental picture, it's like all the gods coming together as a council and witnessing that exchange, or all the rulers coming together as one council to acknowledge the exchange from one age to the other. Um, the, The other significance is that Saturn owns the house of Aquarius and the house of Capricorn, both where they're meeting and what we're moving into. And again, Saturn is time, creation, water, all of those things, the harvest. There's a lot of things with that. Um, I can't remember if there's anything else. With the naked eye, no. Um, Mainly because it happens in the middle of the day for a lot of people. Um, Saturn and Jupiter, you'll be able to see because it's a very bright event. The rest of the stars, if you look online, there's online planetariums that you can look and see where everything's going to be during that time. Um, It's really... the, The stars don't have actual power power there are a giant calendar and a clock to tell you what's going on. So, again, this isn't astrology. This is explaining. (laughs) 
<laughs> I got to make that clear because I know there's certain people that. Huh? Yeah. Uh, this is, these are the implementation of what God set in place in Genesis with when he put the stars and the planets in the sky for times and for seasons so that they can be seen, they can be understood. For a neat tidbit, I was reading earlier about the life of Abraham, and it says that at his, at his birth, his father was Terah, who was one of the princes of King Nimrod. And a lot of the, um, the soothsayers and their magicians were at the house during the time of his birth. And when they walked outside after the event, they looked up and there was a star that came across the sky and devoured four of the great planets. And they immediately knew, just by looking at the stars, that one, he was going to be a great man and be prosperous in the earth. Two, that the king needed to know about it because it directly said that he, uh, Abram at that time, before he had the Abraham, experience that Abram would cause great trouble for the king and for other kings around. So that leads into a whole lot of other things where Abraham, Abram got thrown into a fire like three Hebrew children. He walked around in there for three days without getting burned. He came out. The king was awestruck because he came out without being burned. But then he, can't, he got a lot of his riches from there, left, and then Genesis takes the story over from there. But the stars told him about all that, and then 50 years later, the same soothsayers brought up those stars again in his, to accuse him to be burned. And it's like, the, if you want to read it, it's in the book of Jasher, but it's not gospel, it's just there. <laughs> so... Now for my third closing. <laughs> I come from good stock at this point. <laughs> Going once. <laughs> Let's have a good round of applause for Johnny. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Johnny. That was that was good. Amen. Well, let's take a moment and get our evening offering and let's give to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father God. Your word says a child shall lead them. We thank you, Father God, that you've given wisdom to our children who are being raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We thank you for that, Father God. We pray, Father God, that your wisdom and your understanding will come upon this generation in a great way. And that, Father God, that they will be raised up that will serve and that will explain, that will know the Lord and understand the Lord in, in deep ways, ways that we've not known the Lord. They will know the Lord in a, in a new and a vibrant way. 
Father God, as we come this evening, we pray your blessing upon this offering. We pray your blessing upon that which has been given. And Father God, we know that you are the Lord of the harvest and that you will cause us to prosper in all of our ways. Father God, we thank you that you are the one that watches over our seed and you cause it to grow. We thank you, Father God, that as we sow, we shall also reap. And great things, Father God, are ahead of us. For Father God, you have instructed us to walk according to your way. Do not veer to the left or to the right. And then we would be prosperous and we'd be blessed in all of our ways. So, Father God, we make a new determination even today to walk according to your ways and let you cause us to be blessed coming in, going out, that we will be the head and not the tail, that we will be above only and not beneath, that you will cause our basket and our store to be blessed. You will cause our cattle to have many uh, children. You will cause our flocks, Father, to increase. And, Father God, you will cause our planting to yield a mighty harvest. We thank you, Father God, that you are in the business of blessing all that we put our hands to. And Father God, we thank you that we are the children of the living God and that your blessings come in and through our lives. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we will see you on Thursday night. Bring a friend and come to our conference with Joan Hunter. Amen? Amen. You are dismissed.